so it is. All righty, everyone. <clears throat> well, thank you again for being with us. And we're going to uh, finish up, hopefully, we're going to finish up today, Emmett Fox's little booklet, The Seven Main Aspects of God. So, so far we have covered life and truth and love, my favorite one, love and intelligence. And I just wanted to briefly mention something that uh, occurred to me this morning that I, that I didn't mention last week about intelligence. Raymond Charles Barker, one of my favorite writers, wrote a little booklet called um, The Power Decision. And in it, he says that we as human beings can do something that God can't. And that is that we can use intelligence in an unintelligent way. We can use intelligence in an unintelligent way. I think it just cracks me up because we do that. You know, we, we have the power, the intelligence to to make all of these wonderful things, the internet and airplanes and cars and all that, and then we can go we can go about using them in some sort of ridiculous way that causes discomfort and unfortunately causes us harm. So it gives us an opportunity to laugh when uh, when we make a mistake and just say, "Well, that was an unintelligent way to use an intelligence," and then we can move on. And the next time, use it more intelligently. So the premise is simple. The things that we're starting with are simple. Right? Emmett Fox, I told you, is, is one of my favorite writers because he makes things plain. He makes things simple. And he has a very colloquial way of telling things. And the idea is simply that if you consider that different religions, different philosophies, different teachings have come back to the same thread uh, Ralph Waldo Trine calls it a silver thread that runs through all religions. We may look at Trine in, in the immediate future. But we're told over and over again that, that it is done unto us according to our belief. It is done unto us according to our belief. You cast your bread upon the waters, they shall return unto you. <clears throat> I think it's Isaiah who says, My word shall not return unto me void. In Buddhism, we're told everything that you experience is a result of what you have thought. In the Old Testament, in Judaism, we are told, as you think and believe in your heart, now you have to consider what that means, in your heart, so are you, so are you. As, as you think and believe in your heart, so are you. And then in the New Testament, we come to very plainly, it is done unto you according to your belief. When you pray, pray believing in your heart, and it shall be done unto you. So that's a very... <laughs> It's a very succinct way of putting it because sometimes say, people say, well, how come I prayed and, and my prayer wasn't answered, you know. And then we go off into all kinds of explanations. Well, God had a better idea. God is punishing me. God's testing me, all those kind of things. And we we want to come back and say, well, maybe it's because literally if you if you pray believing in your heart, it shall be done, and it didn't happen, well, then maybe there was something in my belief that was lacking. Okay, not, not that I'm defective or broken, but maybe I just didn't quite believe what it was that I was praying for or praying about. And this is what, what Emmett Fox is talking to us about when he's talking about scientific prayer. Are we praying in a manner that removes or helps us to remove, to let go of uh, anything within us that doesn't believe, anything that is disbelief. Now this raises a whole a whole nother batch of interesting topics that we we work on. We talk about through the year. We study in the different books we read. We discuss in our Wednesday night uh, groups. But what is belief? See what is belief? How do you measure belief? You know, it's not it's not like <laughs> now I'm an electronics technician. I'm used to working with oscilloscopes and volt meters. You know, and you could put those on an electronic circuit and you could get a visual graphic representation of what was going on in that circuit. Well, we don't have that for belief. You know, you can't hook a volt meter up to somebody like a lie detector and say, oh, well, you know, their level of belief is high, medium, low, whatever. And, and if, if, you, if you want to think about it even deeper, what is belief? You know, what, 
what really is belief? It's kind of an opinion. It's kind of an idea that something is the way it is, the way we, we believe it is. But what is an opinion? What is an idea? And all these things come back down to they are mental concepts. Right? They're, they're nothing but some sort of a construct that takes place totally within the realm of our own mentality. That, that's what our life is, you know. We think, we think everything is out there. We think that the things that we touch are solid, and they're not. Physics will tell us that they're not. But our experience of them is. But our experience, once again, takes place not in our fingertips when we touch something, but it takes place within our mind, within our consciousness, whatever that, that is. So all I'm pointing out is that we start with a very simple statement. It is done unto you according to your belief. And we could all nod our heads and say, well, yeah, sure, I understand that. But then we get into, well, what is belief? How are beliefs formed? How are beliefs changed? Do we believe the same things today that we believed 50 years ago? You know, If we look at the beliefs in, in humanity over the course of recorded history, remember... Remember, what's recorded in our history books is just a small percentage of the time that life has been available or life has been expressing itself in a self-conscious form, as, as we would call human beings. You know, for hundreds of thousands of years, in, in the Wednesday night group, we're reading, we're reading about cosmic consciousness, and Dr. Buck says that, that one of the signs of self-consciousness is language that we have to develop once we become self-conscious once we can form mental concepts and we can work with ideas we have to have language to express that so from his point of view the development of language kind of um, signals when life moved from the simpler forms of consciousness into a self-conscious being which is which is us which is a human so as you can see that the topic gets deeper and deeper and deeper as you explore it. And that's good because exploring it helps us to come to <coughs> excuse me, a deeper realization of what we do believe and then perhaps why we believe it. Or more importantly, do we want to believe that? Is that what we want to believe anymore? And if we don't want to believe that anymore, then how do we change our beliefs? How do we change that? Now, remember, we're talking about in your heart. You know, as, as, as you think and believe in your heart, so you are. When you pray believing in your heart, so it is. And why, why are they using the terms heart? What does that mean? Well, it means not only the, the idea that you, you think you have, the, the idea that you can express, but the ideas that you hold at a level below your awareness. We had a great discussion on this one night in class, and it's not a subconscious idea, even though psychology might, might have conditioned us to believe that. But it's more of a subliminal idea. And what we're saying is it takes place in a level of consciousness that the conscious mind is not aware of, but yet part of us is conscious of it. So that's why we call it subliminal. And for those, those of you who might remember, you know, there was, there was a great great debate back in the 60s and the 70s about advertisers putting subliminal messages in the advertising and the, the story usually goes you know that at the drive-in movie they inserted every once in a while and they inserted a frame that said something like eat more popcorn or something like that and the popcorn sales allegedly went up at the concession stand but there's a part of us that is intelligent it is active it is constantly doing things but the the part of us that is consciously aware is not aware of what it's doing. Right? So the the picture that we use is the iceberg. Like ten percent of our ten percent of what goes on in this thing called consciousness we are aware of, but the other ninety percent we are not aware of. It's below the level, below the the level the waterline or below the level of our consciousness. That ninety percent that is below the waterline, that's your heart. In, in the biblical terms, at least to my understanding, that's it. So as you think and believe in your heart, it is done unto it, and that's that's done unto you. That's the way you are. 
And the reason I bring that up is it's not as easy as just saying, well, I don't, I don't really believe that anymore. Now, that, that may be something that the intellect is, is telling us, but there may still be a lot going on in our uh, subjective or subconscious or subliminal mind that still, still doesn't agree with our intellect, right? You know, there's an old saying, when the imagination and the will are in conflict, the imagination will win every time. And the example I use is um, if, you've ever, if you've ever been with a child, you know, raised a child and they had a nightmare in the middle of the night and you go in to comfort them and they're afraid because they think there's a monster in the room. And you tell them, well, honey, there's no such thing as monsters, you know. You you don't need to be afraid of something that doesn't exist. It doesn't work, right, because their emotions are up there. <laughs> They're completely involved emotionally. And it, it just doesn't work. You you can turn on the light. You can have them look under the bed. You can have them look in the closet. But ultimately, if you will sit there for a little while and and comfort them and sing to them and tell them a story and get their mind going someplace else, then they start to, to go at ease. So it takes time. It's... It, it tends to take time and it tends to take discipline, consistency, in order to um, change our beliefs. So it's done unto us according to our belief. Humanity believes in separation. God is out there. We are over here. As Wendy gave us in the opening quote from Notes, Notes from the Universe, I think she said it was, right? the author was saying, we need to realize that we already have it. And I, I came came back and said it reminded me of the 23rd Psalm, which says, the Lord shepherds me. I lack nothing. I lack nothing. So what we've been doing here for the last four or five weeks is we have been looking at this little booklet that Emmett Fox wrote, and he said, let's just think about God from seven main directions, from seven main aspects. Let's think about God, and what, let's think about that in a manner that helps us to to come to a deeper understanding and maybe surface some of our old subliminal beliefs and have an opportunity to work with them and change them if we want to change them. So we've looked so far at life. We have, uh, we have looked at truth. We have looked at love, which is unity. And we have looked at intelligence. And today we're going to look at soul spirit and principle and I hope we make it through all three but if we don't it doesn't matter we'll take however long it takes to do these things and, and get through them <laughs> now I will mention that this isn't something that you can do once and then you're done with it it is something that you will do over and over and over and in fact your life is your practice every day of your life you will have an opportunity <clears throat> to reflect upon these seven main aspects of God but today we are looking at what Emmett Fox refers to as soul with a capital S. Not the little S soul, not the idea that there's this part of us that, that, that lives independently of the body and that when the body dies, the soul goes to heaven. Not, not that kind of soul. That's not what he's talking about. It's tied in, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about soul with a capital S as being an aspect or a quality of God. And then he defines it. What he means by that is soul is the ability of the divine to individualize itself in different, different life forms, us. Now, to individualize itself doesn't mean that it has broken itself up into a billion pieces or eight billion pieces or however many people are currently on the face of the earth and however many however many sentient beings exist in other places. But what, what he's telling us is we have to consider that the divine is present and self-conscious as the individual, but the divine is not divided. It is still the whole. It is still the one. <coughs> so the example that, that uh, Emmett Fox gives us today is to consider the electricity in a circuit. And he was an electrical engineer, so he uses electricity a lot in his examples. But we have a nuclear plant less than nine miles from the house generates our electricity, and there's, there's power lines strung out everywhere in every, every direction kind of moving 
away from that. And then there's a dam just a couple miles downstream from that, and they, they do hydroelectric power. So we have the generating plants, and they create, or they, they, <laughs> they convert one form of energy to another, and the electricity is in the wires or on the wires. And it runs to our house, and it runs through an electric light. Now, electricity is present everywhere in that circuit, from, from where it starts at the generating plant to where it returns to the generating plant and pe where it passes through everything in between. But there's only one place in that circuit that it expresses itself as light, and that is in a light bulb. So we have this light bulb in our home, and we can look at that and we could say, well, you know, in reality, what I have there is I have the energy of the, of the entire <laughs> nuclear plant that is available, but I have, I'm, I have a little part of it and it is expressing itself as light. And what Emmett Fox is asking us to consider is, is, that, is that the divine is present everywhere. It's omnipresence. But it is only self-conscious in, in certain spots. And that would be where it is individualized, where it is expressing itself as that self-conscious sentient being. And that is us. That is us as, as beings who, who can become aware of our thoughts, as beings who can become aware of our spiritual nature. Another example that I use frequently is the ocean and the wave. The wave is the ocean waving. This comes from Osho. The ocean is the wa the wave is the ocean waving at us. But the wave is part of the ocean. the The wave is not separated from the ocean. It is not different than the ocean. If you took a sample of the wave, it would be chemically the same as the ocean. But it is the ocean is expressing itself in some unique way as the wave. And we want to think of, of the divine life as all life. And we are the wave. We are the point where the ocean, where, where the divine is waving and it recognizes itself. It can recognize itself as us. We don't recognize necessarily it as us. We have this idea of separation. But it recognizes itself as us. And then the third example that I use is if you were in a, a room and you put dark curtains, black curtains, on all of the doors and windows, so it was completely dark in the room, <coughs> excuse me, and you took some sort of a, a needle or an awl or something that could punch a, a hole in the curtain, and you started to punch holes in the curtain, the sunlight would shine through those holes, assuming it's daytime, of course, but the sunlight would shine through those holes, and you could see little dots of light on the floor of the room. Now those dots of light are not miniature suns. They, they are all the one light. They are the one light of the sun, but it has been individualized. It is expressing itself as that particular dot. So in the Egyptian religion, you know, they would say that each of us is like a ray of the sun. Each of us is like a ray of the sun. There is one life and it is individualizing itself. It is expressing itself through us and as us. And this is what Dr. Fox, Emmett Fox, refers to as soul. Now, we, we think about that and we say, well, this it sounds a little, bit, a little bit strange to us because it might lead to egomania. You know, it might lead to people saying, well, I am God. You know? Now, mind you, the, the mystics have that experience so deeply, I and the Father are one, that they feel that, you know. And Jesus was crucified, if you read the New Testament, for saying he was the Son of God. And then some nine or ten centuries later, uh, al halaj <clears throat> who was a Sufi mystic, was also executed because in his, in his trance, he, he uttered, I am God. He had that sense so deeply. We're not, we're not saying that we are God, but we're saying what we are is, is the divine expressing itself as us. We will never be all that God is, 
but we will always be discovering more of what God as us is. So we have no life of our own, is another way to put it. Our life is not separated from, it's not different than, it is not apart from God. Our life didn't uh, emerge from a, from a pile of chemicals somewhere. But it is, it is some part of the very presence of the divine that is expressing itself as us. And it doesn't differentiate. It doesn't have a sense of self and other like we do. It only knows itself. And that's an important, important point to keep in mind when, when we reflect back on some of our old ideas that God might be punishing us or sending us trouble to teach us a lesson or all of these different things. Because if it couldn't do that to itself, then it can't do that to us. Now, we can learn a lesson when we have trouble, no doubt about it. But we can learn a lesson when we don't have trouble. The, the thing is, is that we usually don't stop and ask what's going on until we're in some kind of trouble. But if every day we got up and said, you know, this is a wonderful world, this is a beautiful life, today I'm exploring, today I'm discovering new and wonderful things about what God is and what I am and what life is, See, we will discover, we will learn every day. Now, in Christianity, this concept that we're talking about is the Christ. The Christ is the point where the human becomes aware of the divinity within. Right? So, in this regard, it is a principle. It is not a person. It's not just one person. But it is, it is within all of us. And, and what we are doing with our spiritual growth is we are awakening to this. And if you look at the way that, <clears throat> that, the, um, that the Bible that we use in, in, in our country uh, in Christianity is laid out, is it starts with, with the book of Genesis, which starts with the idea of separation. Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden. They wanted to explore ideas of good and of evil. Remember, these are just knowledge of good and evil. It didn't say good and evil are two things that exist. It said the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. Remember, I started talking about everything is a mental concept. Everything is inside our heads or inside our consciousness, I should say. But the last book is the book of Revelation. And this is the book where John had the mystical experience. He realized the presence of the divine within. And that is the journey of our soul right there. We start with this idea of separation. As far as we know, right, I mean, there's got to be more after, but as far as we know, we eventually come to this experience, not just the knowledge of, not just the idea about, but this experience of the presence of the divine in me, as me, through me. I have no life of my own. I of my own self could do nothing. It is the Father within me that does the works, is, is what the words of Jesus in the New Testament. That's true of all of us, you see. Who, who by taking thought, could, could grow an inch taller? Think, think about how amazing this life is. You know? We get hungry and we eat. And the food becomes what we need and what we need at that moment. We lack nothing. You know, the Lord shepherds me. I lack nothing. There's a wisdom and an intelligence that knows how to break down that food that we eat and turn it into what is appropriate for us at that time. Our bodies change depending upon what continent <coughs> we, we live on. <coughs> Excuse me. This amazes me. When you think of the very diet that human beings have, you know, one, one group of people might live on nuts and berries and another on whale blubber. How amazing is that, that there's a wisdom and an intelligence that knows how to take this in and knows what to do with it. And that's not you and I doing that. You see, you and I aren't smart enough to do that. I can, I can give you... I can give you a, a plate of food and say, now, I just want you to take a certain part of that out and turn it into muscle, and I want you to take another part out and turn it into blood, and I want you to take another part out and turn it into skin and, and turn this part into hair. 
we wouldn't have a clue. We wouldn't know how to do that. See, But there is something within us that does. There's a divine wisdom within us that does. And what, what Dr. Fox is encouraging us to do here is to think about how magnificent this life is that is expressing itself as us and get our egos out of the way. And if we have something to do, you know, if we have something to do that that may seem a little bit overwhelming to us or may seem like a challenge to us, to stop and think about, this is what he calls scientific prayer, to stop and think about what would the divine see here? How would the divine deal with this situation? And we come to realize that all of the wisdom, all of the knowledge, all of the power, whatever is appropriate is available to us. You know? Now, I'm not saying that we might, we might run out and be able to pick up a, a, a truck. You, know, you hear these things about, about people who, um, somebody's in an accident and a little old lady goes out and lifts up a truck and lifts, lifts the truck up off her husband or something like that. That's possible, right? That those things happen. But it's also possible that we think about how to make a lift, how to, how to get ropes and pulleys and all these kind of things. There's a wisdom that unfolds through us at the level of consciousness we provide for it. And this is what scientific prayer is doing, is expanding our level of consciousness. As Dr. Holmes says, it is expanding the avenue within us through which the divine can flow and express itself to a greater degree. That's all we're trying to do. That's all we are trying to do. So we want to remember then <clears throat> that this life that we are expressing is not our life. We did not create this life. But it is the life of the divine expressing itself individualized as us. And if we could ever, if we could ever really get that and love, see, that and love, love the experience of unity. Soul, spirit is expressing itself as us. Perfect love, perfect love, perfect God, perfect love. The next aspect that he wants, uh, wants us to consider then is uh, what he calls spirit. And what we want to think about is the primary difference between that which we call spirit and that which we call matter. Now, probably the best way to... to explain spirit or to understand spirit, at least the way that I understand it, we tend to think of it as consciousness that is not dependent upon matter, not depending upon the, the body. So, so typically we would say that God is spirit. You know, this is something we would learn in catechism. In the Bible we're told the Father is spirit and must be worshipped in spirit. But spirit is, <laughs> spirit is, and matter is, comes and goes but spirit is it is that which has changed us it is the it is the consciousness it is the life it is the energy that causes matter to take particular forms to take particular shapes to create particular expressions of spirit so i tend to think of it in terms of of uh, my limited understanding of physics you know I, I joke all the time because I, I pick up Stephen Hawking's books and I start to read them and I get two or three chapters in and I think, my God, I understand it. This time I understand it. And then I get to chapter four and say, I don't understand anything. I have no idea what he's talking about. But if we work with the concept that, that before, this particular, before this particular expression of universe that we are now living in, so the physicists will tell us there was nothing. There was, there was nothing. There was no time. There was no space. There was nothing. And then this thing called the Big Bang occurred. And out of that, all of this energy that was there, and there was no matter, there was nothing, but, but some, somewhere the energy came from, and the energy exploded into matter, into universe, into galaxies, into planets, into stars and eventually <clears throat> into plants and animals and us. Now, the, the question that physics can't answer any better than, than religion can answer is, well, what was there before the Big Bang? Right? 
And in physics, it's an unanswerable question because all of the terms and all of the tools that we use in physics wouldn't work at that moment. At that moment, in at that moment in no time, it wouldn't work. We can't weigh it. We can't measure it. We can't. Yet it's, there must have been there because some this big bang. What kicked the can is the question that the physicist asked. What kicked the can? And in, in religious terms, we are told it is a deliberate act of consciousness by a creator. In different religions, not just in, in Judaism, not just in uh, the, the book of Genesis, but in many different religions, in many different cultures, there was this creator being, this consciousness that said, let there be, in one way, shape, or form, let there be. And there was. So this is an important point because if we consider that what life is, is that life is spirit expressing itself in some particular form, in some material body. We understand that material, that matter comes and matter goes. Energy comes and takes the form of matter in some particular shape at some particular time. And then over time that matter disintegrates and goes back into energy over and over again. I remember reading one time when um, we first moved to uh, to the country and uh, got a wood stove. We we're going to heat the house with a wood stove, you know, and um, started to read about firewood and everything. And whoever I was reading simply wrote that the tree collects the energy from the sun and stores it. And then when you burn the log in your fireplace, you're just releasing the energy of the sunlight that was stored in the tree. And I thought, wow, you know, what an amazing concept that, that the tree can collect the energy of the sun and then release it. And that's kind of what, what material, what matter is, right? It comes into being, it's, it's storing energy, but it's really energy taking a particular form. E equals mc squared, and Einstein told us that. And people said, well, if matter is energy, if we could somehow convert the matter back into energy, we could have a, we could have a tremendous energy source. And they did. Right? And, and here's an example of intelligence acting in an unintelligent manner. You know, we created a bomb. We created a bomb. Now we've also created electric power plants, but we created a bomb. But we did kind of demonstrate that energy and matter are just two different states of the same thing. But, but the energy state is <laughs> see, the first and the last, right? We have the energy that comes into, into form, and then we have the form which disintegrates back into <clears throat> energy. And what moved upon the energy? What, what caused the energy to take a particular form at a particular time? And in religious teachings, we're told it is a conscious act of the Creator who said, let there be. The <clears throat> Spirit moved upon the waters and said, let there be. And there was. So this is, this is very, very important for us. One of the most important uh, aspects, I think, for us to consider because when we believe entirely in materialism, when we believe entirely in the power of matter, the void from spirit, and, the, <laughs> and two things about matter. Right? The first thing is inertia. It doesn't, it doesn't move. It just sits there like, like, you know, like the, the movie, just lay there like a slug. The uh, <clears throat> a Christmas story was the name of the movie. It, it's, iner, it's inert. It, it just lays there. It it's, it's just has, has no uh, momentum. It has no initiative. It's just there. It's obvious that something has to move it. Something has to move it. On. And it's always decaying. It's always decaying. So if we believe that what our life is, is matter expressing itself as life, as opposed to life and spirit expressing itself as matter, then it's easy to see why <coughs> we accept decay and sickness and disease and all these things that, that human race consciousness believes in. Right? 
And remember I said the, you know, the 10% is above the waterline and 90% is below. At that 90% that's below the waterline, we are part of race consciousness, collective consciousness, as Jung called it. And it has all kinds of ideas that it believes in. And we kind of swim in that. And we get some of that on us uh, every once in a while. Joel Goldsmith said that beautifully. He said, don't ever, you know, if you... If you're thinking about uh, a particular situation, don't ever try to figure out, well, what, you know, what was I thinking that, that caused this particular condition to come to me? He said, just realize that uh, we're all kind of swimming in a cesspool of race consciousness and we get some of it on us. And it's not to worry about <laughs> which particular idea latched onto us. What we need to do is, is turn away from those ideas and turn entirely towards God. Same thing Joel uh, Ernest, Emmett Fox says. Turn away from the problem, turn towards God. Right? So the human condition, the human experience, believes very heavily in matter. And, and this was kind of the, you know, the, I guess in the 1600s, around that time, with the philosophers, the different arguments that were going back. Matter somehow, matter whose primary property is to be inert, somehow organized itself in a way that created life. That's the materialist view of the world. And then the spiritual view of the world is, is that spirit caused the matter to organize itself in such a way that it was a perfect vehicle for spirit to express itself. Right? And of course that's the one that, that we take because we're looking at things from a spiritual point of view. I read something a few weeks ago that just just really um, kind of made me sit up and go, aha. And what the author said is, from the, from the moment our body begins, from the moment our body begins to grow, from the time that the, the sperm and the egg unite and multiplication and division of cells starts, we are dying. Our bodies are dying. We are not dying, but our bodies are dying. Let me rephrase that. Every, you know, while you and I are here together on this, on this call on a Sunday, you know, how many millions or billions or trillions, I don't know, but a bunch of cells die and they are replaced with new cells all the time, all the time. So there's this cycle of matter replacing itself. And what the author said is, is that when, when our death comes, it's not because we're dying, because we've always been dying. It's because we're not growing fast enough to replace the cells that are dying off. Right? So we want to constantly be excited about life. We want to be enthusiastic about life. We want to constantly be getting these new cells as they come into being, to, to, be, to be coming into a joyful place, a joyful state. But we always want to remember that we are spirit. We are part of that which was never born. We are part of that which will never die. We are expressing, we as spirit are expressing this life in these physical forms while we are here. But they are not necessary for our life because our life is not dependent upon matter which matter is nothing but energy coming into form directed by the Spirit. This is why it's done unto you according to your belief. If you stop and think about how simple that is. The Divine said, let there be, and there was. You and I, as individualized expressions of the Divine, we can speak our word as well. We can say, let there be, and there is. And, and we say, well, why is it that... Why is it that we speak our word and sometimes it isn't? And it's because we don't have the faith of God. The divine can never doubt. It just knows and it knows that it knows. But we know and then we're not so certain we know. And this is what the process of building belief is. This is why, and this is what the process of, of affirmative prayer is. This is what the process of our education is. Building that belief, building that belief every day, every day. And the last, I made it, I made it. The last aspect that we're talking about today is that one that we just led into. He calls it principle. 
Now, a principle is something that is always the same, right? So we have, we have, we, we call them laws in physics, right? We have the law of gravity. Uh, we have the law of conservation of energy, which is really cool if you think about it, because it says that energy cannot be created, energy cannot be destroyed. Energy is, <clears throat> and it can only change form. It can only change form. So think about that. We don't create the energy. We don't destroy the energy. We just change form. You say, well, that's, how is that, you know? Well, we had energy came into the house and it, it lit up the light bulb, you know, but it converted to heat, converted to heat. It didn't go away. It exists as heat. <laughs> Law of gravity, you know, you drop something off the top of a building, it goes, it goes down. It doesn't just lay out there and say, hey, you know, what do you want me to do? It goes. Law of gravity is a principle. <clears throat> so what... What <coughs> Emmett Fox is asking us to think about here is the consistency of the divine as principle. The principle is it is done unto you according to your belief. Change your thinking, change your life. As you think and believe in your heart, so are you. And we want to come to, to a place where we get that intellectually. We say, okay, yeah, you know, <clears throat> all these different places have been telling us that. I understand that. But we want to get to the place where we truly believe that. And we truly try that, and we truly put that to work in our lives. <clears throat> so what he's telling us then is, <clears throat> you know, if ever we think something may or may not be working, particularly if we are engaged in, in our prayer life, and it seems not to be working. We want to come back to remind ourselves, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is done to us according to our belief. I'm not seeing the result that I would like to see. I haven't seen it yet. But that doesn't mean that the principle doesn't work. It just means that somehow, some way, I am not quite working with it properly. And I will keep working and I will keep changing my technique and I'll keep trying different ways and I'll keep doing different things all along the lines of working with that principle. Dr. Holmes tells us that if anything works, there's a way in which it works and anyone who is willing to discover that way can work with it. I was having this conversation with, with the, some folks a week or so ago, jokingly, and uh, we were talking about how, how brave were the Wright brothers? Nobody taught them to fly. You know, they went out to Kitty Hawk. <laughs> they built an airplane that was basically a kite that they tethered into the, into the sea breeze so they could get lift and they could practice learning how to control. Right? They had to control this thing. <laughs> that was a problem the aviators had. They could get off the ground, but they couldn't, <laughs> couldn't always get back. They built an engine when there were no airplane engines to be had. They built one. And then they had to teach themselves to fly. They had to teach themselves to fly. So what we have to do is, is we have to learn how to work with the principle that is there. Right? So gravity and lift and thrust, <clears throat> they were all there. And the Wright brothers had to figure out how to work with those principles in order to get their airplane off the ground. We're a little bit better off than they are. We have had teachers go before us for thousands of years who have basically told us the same thing. It's done unto you according to your belief. The oracle at the Temple of Delphi said, Know thyself. What do you believe? What do you believe about God? Because that's yourself. What you believe about God is what you believe to be true about yourself. So if we are ever sort of discouraged in our prayer and we and we, what we tend to do when we are just we tend to go back to our old ways and if we ever start to get discouraged in our prayer life and we think well you know maybe God wants me to have this condition we want to stop and erase that cancel and replace as uh, Reverend James and Reverend Joan used to say in Durham you know think of a, a dry erase board and you've just written something you really don't want on that erase it just erase it and then replace it cancel it and replace it. It's not, that, it's not that God would want me to have this problem. I said, I just haven't learned to believe about it 
correctly yet. That's all. Excuse me, I get a drink of water. I just haven't learned how to think about it correctly yet. I haven't learned to believe about it yet. I haven't, I may believe it in my head, but I haven't moved it down to my heart. And we used to say in class that that's the, the longest 18 inches in the world is from the head down to the heart. You can hear it, you can think about it, you can read it, you can nod, you can hold hands, you can sing, you can sway, you can do all those things about it. But until you get it down into your heart, until you, you believe it, it's not so. And here's, here's an example. It happened to me, and then I heard another, uh, another facilitator tell the same story. It happened to him as well. <coughs> First time you go to England, you've heard your whole life that they drive on the wrong side of the road because it's not the side we drive on. It must be wrong right? in, our, in our arrogance. But at least they drive on the other side of the road. And we know that. You've seen the movies. You know, you've watched James Bond. You've done all these things. You know that they drive on the other side of the road. And when you get there, you may even rent the car, which is crazy. They'll rent you a car. You don't have to take a driving lesson, but they'll give you a car. And then all of a sudden, you discover, holy mackerel. Everything's, everything's backwards, you know. The steering wheel's on the other side of the car. The stick shift is on my left hand, you know. I have to learn how to how to drive with everything backwards. And then they just for fun they put a roundabout in every couple of miles just, just to see if you can live and you can survive and get through it. And you may go through all of that experience. And now you well, yeah, I know they drive on the other side of the road. I've seen it in the movies. I know they drive on the other side of the road because I drove the car from the airport to the hotel. And now you go to a business meeting downtown London and you have to cross the street and what do you do? What did I do? What did the facilitator that was also told the story do? Look over the wrong shoulder. Right? Because we are accustomed to when we step off the curb, traffic comes from the left. And then you go to step off the curb and you look to the left and the cars are coming from the right and you almost get hit. It's at that moment, it's at that moment that you go, oh my goodness. I really don't believe that they drive on the wrong side of the road. I just know about it. Keep that image in mind. Keep that, keep that anecdote in mind. You want to get from knowing about the seven aspects of God to believing the seven aspects of God. Every day our life is our practice. Every day we have an opportunity to think about these things, to, to examine our life. What are the problems in our life? And what aspects of God would counter those problems? What are the opportunities we want to pursue in our life? And, and what is the aspect of God we are trying to express more fully with that opportunity? Every day, every day is an opportunity to do this. Emmett Fox says, think about the seven main aspects twice a day. <clears throat> he says, now, if, if it takes you a little bit longer to process, you know, think, think about them once a day. And I chuckle and I said, and, and if you're a minister, you need to think about one for a week or so before you move on to the next, <laughs> because it's really going to take you a while. Think about what you're thinking about. What do you believe to be true about God? Why do you believe that to be true about God? What other ways are there believing about God? How does your life reflect your beliefs about God? Are you stepping curb and looking in the wrong direction because that tells you what you really believe. Not what you say you believe, but what you really believe. Do we believe that God is life? Do we believe that God is truth? <clears throat> Do we believe that God is love? Do we believe that God is intelligence? Do we believe that God is individualized soul? Do we believe that God is not dependent upon matter, but is spirit? And do we believe that God is consistent and acts as principle that responds to us according to our belief? That is it in a nutshell. That is everything there is to know if we can just put it into practice. So I encourage you, if you haven't found it, this little booklet is available uh, in audio book format on YouTube. You can, you can download. I haven't listened to it. I don't know how pleasant the voice is. Excuse me. But you can download the, the the booklet or you can put it put the bookmark the uh, 
page and you can listen to this um, once a day, twice a day, whenever the mood strikes you. This is your spiritual growth. Your spiritual growth is, as Wendy opened us, realize, realize that you already have it. It's already there. And the only thing that separates you from it is an idea, and ideas can be changed. And so it is.